Well, hallelujah. Here we are for another Shabbat. And the music was great. We sounded the shofar. And now we're going to begin our word study for this Shabbat, which is week 38. Um, everybody get your scriptures open. If you need scratch paper, there's plenty of it over there by the, uh, the donation bowl. And if not, then get your scriptures open because we're, what we're going to do is we're going to study one word out of every portion of the Torah portions for this week. Uh, we're going to study one word out of the Torah, half Torah, and the Brit Hadashah portion as well. That's why there's three and there's, that's why there's also one Greek word that we're going to look into as well. Um, but amazingly enough, we serve an ultimate being that has preeminence over all things. And we were studying the word hallel in one of the past studies that we have done. And Brother Vance asked a, a very important question. He was saying that in modern Hebrew, we do see the connections used by the scribes and, and, and uh, many other writings um, of there being the same definition of the word praise and uh, hallel, which is hallelujah, hallelujah way, more uh, exclusively that means hallelujah way. We'll get that out of the way right now. Um, but he asked the question, well, we also see that term used in the word Baruch. Well, in the study of one of the words that we're going to study out of the portions today, I began to do the etymology, the roots of that word in the ancient Pedro, and it's connected. So this study will answer that question that he asked, is it, is it connected linguistically? Teddy, before you continue, because... Right. And, and when we get done, I'll do the closing as well. Well, as you're going to see, all of those, uh, we'll just point it out as we go into the study. Um, but if you, if you know anything about the way to study the etymology of a word, going from the Strong's all the way to Jeff Benner's hieroglyphics, you'll be able to see these connections about what he's talking about, which we're going to go through today. Um, and it's definitely uh, linked to just always, or for the most part, almost always to a two-letter root in the Hebrew. And these are the two-letter roots that we're going to see today. Hallelujah. What we'll do is, is we're going to go into the Torah portions, and we'll read, um, first, we'll be in 1 Samuel. First Samuel chapter eleven. Okay. And at verse one. Page. Laying the foundation, this is where King Saul, or Shaul, finds a problem with some of the people trying to make covenants with folks that shouldn't be made. And so he sends out a reminder to everyone in this chapter. You guys can go back and read this later if we don't get to that in our Torah reading study today. Um, and remember, it always has something to do with pieces of animals that have been severed. Okay, and the study of this word that we're going to study here, let's read verse 1 there in chapter 11. And Nahash the Ammonite came up and camped against Yabesh Gilad. Now remember at this point, uh, Yahushua ben Nun had already gone to sleep with his fathers. Okay, so here we are some years later, and we know that Gilad was the property of Yisrael. Now, so you see the problem here. All right? There's, all, there's already beginning to be a struggle over Gilad. So, 
it says, And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we shall serve you. Now this is the first word that we're going to study there, and it's the English word covenant, and it's in the Strong's number 1285 in the Hebrew. And it's pronounced berit. Okay? So, what I'll do is, is I'll read those definitions out of the Strong's and then we'll study the etymology of this word and look at, look at how this amplifies what covenant actually means. And, and we as a group have been over this as of lately with some of the people in the group. Yeah. When are we and when are we not in covenant with the king? Well, as we're going to see, this has something to do with pieces. It has something to do with passing between the pieces. And it has something to do with that covenant which was made with our father, Abraham. There is no other covenant. Yahweh has never made a covenant with any other people other than Israel. The descendants and the seed, the seed, meaning Yahshua, that came through his, his sons, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's, that's who the promises were made to, and that's, that's why Saul, uh, King Saul finds a problem here, because you can't give up his land. It's been promised to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov and their descendants. What they're doing in Israel right now is hacking up the land, and so they are definitely not in covenant. covenant. And King Saul at this point, before he had his momentary lapse of, in my humble opinion, stupidity, um, knew the definition of these covenants. And these covenants were made in all eastern uh, tribes of people. These, these ways of covenant were no, it wasn't just for Israel. Every nation in the east used these forms to make covenant. It was a law in those lands in those days. So that covenant, if we are children of Abraham, we are bound to that. We are bound to the same thing. We cannot give up the land. We cannot give up our hearts to other men, other mighty ones, because then we're not in covenant with him. Now we're going to see some of the... Uh, the de now remember, in the Strong's, these are kind of abstract <laughs> definitions, but nevertheless, we need to go over them first if, before we go into Jeff Benner's uh, lexicon to look at the concrete definitions there. We need to understand what, uh, get a just of just what these words mean. And the first one is number 1285. Number 1285 in Strong's Hebrew section of, of the concordance is very, and it comes from 1262. Now, anytime you see where it says from, that means that's how you start studying the etymology of that word. Where is its roots? What does it mean? And what did its roots mean? Because as we're going to see, there are a few different uh, Hebrew letters in Berit than there is in its root, where it comes from. Remember, it's a family. It's a family. The Hebrew language is set up like a family. So the two letters, the two letter root is the bet and the resh, and then when you begin to add other Hebrew letters to it, it becomes family. They're family cognates. They have cognate relations. So, Without the building of the letters or the alphabet or these pictures, you can't have new meaning to these things. So we're going to study this back and see where the family came from of that word because it's had other letters added to it. Okay? So, Berit means in the same sense of cutting. And the reason that is is because... Uh, uh, erit is the root word for divorce. So here we see the phonetic cognates, the pho meaning the letters that are in relation to the other letters in this word, 
See, that when you take away and add another letter, it takes on another meaning. That's the way this beautiful language is set up. So we see here in Berit, even that's why they give us the definition there, a cutting, because in Hebrew, a, a, a divorce means a cutting away of. And it's also the same root of circumcision. So whenever a man is circumcised, he's cutting away the flesh. And that flesh dies. And of course, we know what is exposed after that. But it means it's a sign. That's why Abraham and all of his descendants were to be circumcised because it was a sign of the covenant that they had separated themselves from the flesh. The a cutting away of. The Brit Malah. Yes. Covenant. Yes. And that, that is part of the covenant. So it can never be taken away. So all the brothers out there that are teaching against physical circumcision, I beg to differ. Anyhow, that's a whole, that's a whole different subject. So the following is the rest of that definition. A compact. Because made by passing between pieces of flesh. And that's what happened here in the 11th chapter of 1 Samuel, King Saul begins to hack up a bunch of cows, calves, however it's translated in most English translations, and he sends it throughout all the tribes of Israel. And he said, so shall it be to every man's cattle if he does not come up to fight with us against these people. And I believe, in my own humble opinion, he's reminding them of the covenant that was made with Abraham. Because Abraham didn't pass through those pieces. Yahweh did, as we're going to see. Right? Okay, so that's the definition of that. And its root word, okay, it comes from 1262, which is Barah. Okay, now as you, I just want to show you so you can see this as we go into it. Here is the, uh, as we're going to see when we get to the bottom of the etymology... We're going to see that the bet, resh, and the uh, calf is going to be the root word of all of these words. But even if you successfully translate or transliterate all of these Hebrew words into English, notice this. The two-letter root of all of these, that's the parent root, is a B and an R. A bet and a resh, right? I want you to look at every one of these words transliterated, and what do you see in them? A vowel point. No, what do you see in them? Yeah. A B and an R. Yeah. See, that's, that's another way to see if what you're looking at and somebody is teaching you has been transliterated or translated correctly. You will always, even in the English, you will still see the parent roots. And if you don't, red flag goes up, and we need to rethink what we're saying. We need to get back in here and go back into Jeff Bitter's uh, book and, and kind of set things straight. Okay? Now, the definition of, of number 1262, bara in Hebrew, and this is a primitive root, so that you can't study that back any further in the Strong's. That's when you have to go into these other books. Okay? It means to select. So here we see that the covenant that was made People were what? Selected to be in covenant with him. Also, to feed. What are we supposed to feed on? His word. Yahshua said, I am the bread of life. And shall not bread alone. And it also carries the definition of to render clear. You are free of judgment if you are in covenant with Him. Now this is where a lot of us need to start getting, uh, our strong point needs to be focused on is what causes you to be in covenant with Him and what causes us not to be in covenant with Him. And I guarantee you, it's going to, all of it's going to be connected to Torah. All of it. There's no ways around that. Now, before we get into the etymology, we see that it's talking about pieces here, and people were selected. Can we take those 
definitions and prove that theory by definition in Scripture. Yes, we can. All we've got to do is look at our father Abraham's life. What happened to him? He was the first called out one, you guys. He was the, the church wasn't formed in Acts chapter 2. It was formed when Abraham was called out of the world. He was the first called out one, and Galatians chapter 3 tells us that Yahweh first ministered the good news to Abraham himself. Okay? So, let's go to Scripture. Genesis chapter 15. We're going to be reading 6 through 18. Now here's, here's where we get to see um, that they're pretty much, even, even with the abstract definitions in, in the Strong's, they're pretty much in line here to give us a very beautiful picture. Um, we just got to know where to look to see it in Scripture. So this is just a few times that this is used. Uh, beginning at verse 6. Everybody there? And he believed in Yahweh, and he reckoned it to him for righteousness. And he said to him, I am Yahweh, whom brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, now notice here, one thing that I need to point out. He said to Abraham, this land is for you and your descendants. According to the promise that was made to Abraham, no other people on the face of this planet has the right to that land. And if Israel, I said, this is what I'm, this is what I'm showing you. Nobody, if, if Israel as a nation, when they were given that little spot, which isn't the nation of Israel, it's the state of Israel, but if they would have moved in there and the Yahudim that did make it back in, I'm talking about descendants of Yehuda. If they would have made it back in there and they said, what is your constitution? And they said, Torah. Then they would have had a right to claim the land. But they didn't. They accepted other governing rules. Okay? So here we see that only, the, only Abraham and his descendants scripturally have the right to this land. And it's bound, that promise is bound in Yahweh's name here. Verse 8, and he said, Master Yahweh, whereby do I know that I possess it? He says, I hear you speaking to me, but how do I know that this promise you're giving me is real? How do I know it's going to really happen? Look what he says. In verse 9, and he said to him, bring me three-year-old heifer, sacrifice. There's going to be a sacrifice in this land. There's going to be a sacrifice in order you to get into the land. And that sacrifice will be binding as an oath. He swore by his own name, which there's no name greater that he could swear by. And he took an oath. And he said, I'm going to show you a symbol of how we're going to know that all of your descendants are going to inherit this land because Yahshua HaMashiach is going to lead them there when all of the smoke is clear. Okay? He said, he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Here we see the three, and we remember we've been going over the sevens, the threes. Very symbolic numbers with our father. And he took all these to him and cut them in the middle. See, here, here we go. He cut them in the middle and placed each half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. Verse 11, And the birds of prey he came down on the carcasses, and Abraham drove them off. See that? Abraham drove the, the fowl of the air that were not supposed to be partaking of these sacrifices, and he shooed them away. Showing us symbolically that the good news would come to the father Abraham that would not allow our carcasses to be carried away by the enemy. <laughs> this is deep. 
Now watch this. And it came to be when the sun was going down, and a deep sleep fell upon Abram, that see a frightening great darkness fell upon him. And he said to Abram, Know for certain that your seed are to become sojourners in a land that is not theirs. He said, We're going to have to, they're making the covenant. And let me let me lay it out to you. We just read. They put a part of the animal that was cut on one side of the path, and they put another part of that animal on the other side of the path. And this is an ancient covenant that was made between all kings who were covenanted with each other. Okay? This king and his people would walk through those pieces and go to the other side. And this king and his people would walk through and go to the other side. Therefore, coming into covenant. And so shall it be to anyone who breaks this covenant, you will end up like those pieces of sacrifices. And it was bound. But we notice here that Yahweh bound it in his name. The reason why he caused his son to sleep was because he knew his descendants would be his demise. If Abraham was allowed to walk through these pieces, Abraham would have been cut and sunder. So Yahweh says, don't worry, I've got your back. Verse 14. But the nation whom they serve, I am going to judge. And we know that Egypt isn't even Egypt anymore. Remember, they not only have they went through some hardships and, and been conquered a few times, but their government has fallen to the ground and is no longer their, their land. That was just a few years back. Mm -hmm. So here we see that these are perpetual judgments. And afterward, let them come out with great possessions. And we know that that, that came to pass. Now, as for you, you are to go to your fathers in peace. Not pieces, but in shalom. You are to be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the crookedness of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now remember, we just read about the Amorites, and they were trying to make a covenant with them. That's why, that's why Saul was like, uh-uh, no you don't. May I remind you? And he sent pieces out. We're going to see why. I believe that he was sending a message. And it came to be when the sun went down and it was dark. That see, Now remember, he had caused a deep sleep to fall upon Abram. Right? I need you to rest, son. I need you to rest. Now remember, usually the leader of one side and the leader of the other would both pass through the pieces. And if, if one of those kings or one of those leaders uh, ever violated the covenant rules, then his own people would cut him asunder. Because then you're putting the whole tribe, the whole land in jeopardy of judgment. Death. Right? So now Abram's caused to go to sleep and watch what Yahweh does. Verse 17, And it came to be when the sun went down and it was dark that see a smoking oven and a burning torch passing between the pieces. <laughs> On the same day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abram, saying, I have given this land to your seed, from the river of Mitzrayim to the great river, the river Euphrates. And that's, that's far enough. You see what he did? He redeemed his servant by giving him rest. And he said, your descendants are going to break covenant with me, so I can't allow you to pass through these pieces there's a huge legal purpose why Abraham was never allowed to pass through those pieces. Had he passed through the pieces, he, had to, he would have had to been held accountable for what his people had done. So this gives a little bit different, uh, sheds a little bit different light on what was going on with King Saul here. We also see this... Um, Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 34 and then we'll move on. We'll be reading verses 
17 through 19 here. So this wasn't just something that stopped when Abram received the covenant, as we're going to see. Verse 17, Therefore thus saith Yahweh, You have not obeyed me in proclaiming release, each one to his brother. And what this whole chapter's got to do is they were supposed to be following the Torah principles of at the end of every seven years that they were supposed to release their brothers that had come into bondage with them. And they refused to do it. They said that they would, and then he began to bless them again, but now they turned right around when they were supposed to release them and said, no, we're, we're not going to do it. Every seven years or every 50 years? Jubilee? I believe it's every seven years they're supposed to set their brother free, but we'll go back and look at it. I don't think a, a brother is supposed to be left in, uh, in bondage to you for 50 years. Yeah. I don't think so. But we'll look at it. Anyway, it says, Therefore thus saith Yahweh, you have not obeyed me in proclaiming release, each one to his brother, each one to his neighbor. See, I am proclaiming release to you, declares Yahweh, to the sword, to the pestilence, to the scarcity of food, and I shall make you a horror to all reigns of the earth. And this is where we're seeing what happens to people that say they're following the covenant and then they won't. Verse 18, And I shall give the men who are, tran who are transgressing my covenant, whom have not established the words of the covenant. And that, we, look at this. This is a very, very important word. It's everywhere in your scriptures. Read it. We have not established the words of the covenant. See, there's words that came out of Yahweh's mouth that establishes the rules and the precepts of the covenant. That's why Yahshua was telling them, man shall not live by bread alone. He was the bread. He was telling them, after I give this sacrifice, you can't live just by my sacrifice. But by every word that has proceeded forth out of the mouth of my father. That's a hallelujah. Right on. You see, the covenant rules never changed. But the sacrificial system concerning it at this time has. Mm -hmm. And Yahshua was making a very bold statement. He said, after I give this sacrifice, I am the bread of life. But he was also speaking from his inner man. I am the word. We have not established the words of the covenant which they made before me when they came, when they cut the calf in two. See that? There it is again in Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. And passed between the parts of it. Verse 19. The heads of Yehuda and the heads of Yerushalayim, the eunuchs and the priests, so on and so forth. See that? It doesn't have to do with just one certain group of people. Even the eunuchs who were not even able to come into the Holy of Holies because of their physical condition. Still bound by that same covenant. Okay? So here we see that this thing went on and on and on and on. It was not uh, done away with at any point during the history of the Scriptures. Okay. Now... To clarify even more things, let's look at the phonetic cognates, the family of letters that come from those two words. That let's let's search that back, okay, and see where Bari and Barah comes from. Now this is where Vance's. Uh, Mom, could you turn down the heater? Sure. This is where Vance's question is going to be answered that he asked about the word Hallel. Was it connected to Baruch? Here's the answer in the study of this. That's why I wanted to go ahead and study that back a little bit because he asked that question. And rather than me give him a Teddy Wilson answer, we can use the Hebrew here to, to answer that question. All right? So these two words are linguistically connected, and that's what I mean by phonetic cognates. 
to number 1263 and 1288. Number 1263 is Baruch, and this is the word that was in question. But as we're going to see, it doesn't have the same family relations, nor does it have the same biblical definitions as we're going to see by looking into Jeff Bear's ancient biblical Hebrew. All right? The lexicon there. Okay, number 1263 is Baruch. Baruch means blessed. Even in the, even in the, even in the uh, strong, we begin to see, uh, uh, we don't see any connections there phonetically or by definition to the word Hallel. We don't see that. And, and, and a further study of the word is going to make it even clearer. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about Baruch is that it comes from 1288. So, 1288 is this word. These are the ancient hieroglyphics. These are the pictures that Yahweh was showing us. Bet, Resh, Kaf. Okay? The definition of Barak number 20 or 1288, it means to kneel, to bless Elohim, an act of adoration, or vice versa. It can also mean to curse. That is Baruch. No, this is the root of Baruch. So it's Baruch. But that's why they translated that verse in Job. It's Baruch. Baruch. They actually translated it there where Job's wife said, uh, why don't you curse Elohim and die? That is the Hebrew word for blessing there. So in my humble opinion, we really need to look at the way the old King Jimmy's got that and most other English translations have that translated. The word curse there in Job is Barach or Baruch in Hebrew, which means blessing. So uh, anyway, this is what this pictures. This is what the true, as we're going to see in the concrete definitions of this word, Barach, Yahweh is bigger than we are. Right. Thankfully. We are His children. And we'll never be able to see eye to eye with Him while we're here on this earth. The way it is. So what happens is, when Yahweh comes to us, in, to those who are in covenant, look at the picture we see here. When Yahweh comes to us and selects us, that was one of the definitions, right. to, and He selects us out of the world just as He did Abraham, we go into covenant with Him. And what He does is this. This is a huge picture of a father coming to his child in his disobedience and going, The creator of all living things is getting on his knees and blessing us as children and saying, come to me. Come here. I want to tell you something. Don't you call me out of my name around these people. You give me reverence and you better be a good boy and follow daddy's Torah. You must proclaim your father's name to these people, to this nation, to that nation, to all nations. And you must share this covenant with them that they may be blessed as I am blessing you today. And as the father stands, an obedient child would say, okay, father, I'm sorry. And I agree to let you baruch me and I baruch you. I get on my knee as you have gotten on your knee before me and called me and selected me to be in covenant with you. It means to bend at the knee. Yahweh is getting on him, a king, just like Solomon did when he dedicated the temple. You see that? 
This word covenant is a beautiful thing. And it has a lot more to do with just having a set of rules. Do you understand that the one who created all living things has got on his knees and pleaded us to come into covenant with him? See, the study of this beautiful language reveals to us so much more than just a word. He is exalted above all things, even His Word. Now, let's go to Jeff Benner. You guys on your handouts there. That'll be this one. Line 2, 11 and 20. We are going to look at these Hebrew pictographs. The letter Bet, Resh, and Kaf is the three-letter root to every one of these Hebrew words that we just looked at. If you do the etymology of that word, you are going to come to this. Now, remember, it's, it's a family. That's why we call them cognates, <laughs> and phonetic cognates or or uh, related by definition. It's all a system of cognates. Now notice the two letter, these are the parent roots. The bet and the resh. And that's why you see bet resh, bet resh, bet b and r. This is a b in English and an r in English. And if you successfully do these things, you see b and r everywhere. So that is the two letter root of, of, um, of all of these. Okay? But we are going to be looking at Barach. Bet, Resh, Kaf. All right? There's a couple of different approaches you can take when using the hieroglyphics here. You can look at these pieces of paper and look at the picture. And then you're going to see the meaning of the picture just to the right of that. Okay? We see that the bet is a tent floor plan. That's what it pictures. Right? Did Shaul in the Brit Hadashah, our New Testament, not say that we are a tent? He said that this tent is temporary, correct? Why? Because it's the flesh. Because if you're the bride... When he comes back and you make that first cut and you meet him up in the sky, you become one with him. You are now, we are going to put off this earthly tent and we are going to be just as he is. It says he, we will see him as he is. So this picture is very relevant to what we see written in the Brit Hadashah. Now look at the meaning. Family. House. Okay? Now, I want to point something out in studying that word. If we know the Hebrew, what's the first Hebrew book in the scriptures? Bereshit. Okay. And that takes a very similar re resemblance to this. Mm -hmm. But did you know that in, if you look up that Hebrew word, you will not see a bet? You don't have to look up a bet. The bet was added. It's just rare eat. You know why they did that? Because everything that they write after this has to do with the building of his house. Not that it... See, anciently in the writings, they were saying the house will be built, and this is the top. Remember, we went over that. And it was the stake or the cross. He was showing us that his house would be built on that. And that's why Yahshua said, I am the Aleph and the Ta. He's the Word. He's everything in between. Correct? And he went to the stake in order to build the house. But if you look up beginning there, it's not gonna the, the word doesn't start with a with a bet. It begins with a, a resh. So the, the, the bet was anciently put there because what they were saying is 
They were looking at the picture and they were saying house. His house. And then they went into the words after that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now remember, that wasn't an alphabet or alphabet in the beginning. It was pictures and the pictures told the story themselves. Man made letters out of these things. So you, you have to really study linguistics in order to be able to submit the truth. Rightly divide it. Rightly divide it. Because remember, um, oftentimes you've seen things in the Messianic Scriptures where um, they would say, who is this is teaching that he has not learned in letters? In other words, they knew the ancient hieroglyphic meanings of the modern Hebrew and that's what they were saying about Yahshua. Hey, most common people know nothing about the hieroglyphics. Mm -hmm. But he knows all things. Why? Because that's who he was. Right. Ding! <laughs> <laughs> that's what, it wasn't that he had never been taught to write. Right. Because even, even his disciples knew how to read the Torah. He said, they're not learned in We didn't teach them how to understand. Even the school, I submit to you, even the school of Hillel and Shammai may not have went to that level, uh, which is contrary to many beliefs. That's something I myself am indulged in right now, seeing exactly what did they teach in those schools. What about the Malio as well? That's what I mean. Did they know the ancient hieroglyphic means? But we know that Yahshua did because they said, who taught this man letters? In other words, the letters meant something else right. in the beginning. I've often wondered when in the story where they bring, I guess, Miriam, and they're going to stone her, he says, uh, he without sin casts the first stone, but he writes in the dirt. Right. And there, well, I won't go into a teaching that I learned. It was just like really heavy because the the for what she was, she did, mm -hmm. and there was that. The thing that is always missed out of that whole scenario is go and sin no more. Well, and and adding and to that, that goes back to before we get way off the track, just adding to that briefly. There was a specific command that when you catch a woman in adultery, was supposed to be dealt with, and they went all over town looking for him just to bring her to him. Wasn't if a man was jealous of his wife, was he not supposed to take her to the priest and she was supposed to drink the water that was mixed up by the, the dirt? That's it. You understand what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's saying, you didn't follow the command and you bring her to me to see what I will judge so that you can blame me for it. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll turn that around on you and go ahead and say, you who have not sinned cast the first stone on this woman. Because not until she was actually found guilty they said that she was caught in the very act. Then why didn't they follow protocol of Torah? Right. That was very well explained. Now, um, a few other things we, we need to look at here. We see uh, the next letter is the resh there. It's the head of a man. Now, who is the head of the body? Keep that in mind. And it means, it has the meaning, first, top, and what? Beginning. Ah. So the bet in the beginning had something to do with the head. <laughs> See, the, the bet and the head. The, the house and the head. The head of the household showed us how the house would be built. There's the blueprints. And then it was shown again to Moshe on the mount. Same blueprints. By the same finger. Same DNA. Uh, and, and here we see the uh, calf. It means open palm. Now remember, we were going over the yod last time. And it, it, it's, it's the picture of a little arm with, with like a hand. Well, actually, that's, a, a, that's the symbol when it's speaking in reference to the hand. A closed hand. Now here we see that the calf is an open palm. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the, and the uh, meaning is to bend. 
Wait a minute. The head of the house would bend his knee to the children to make the covenant. Wow. You see how this stuff, once you go back to this and you just look at these definitions, you can see what the pictures mean. Forget the abstract definitions in everybody's theology. These pictures tell the story. Our mighty one bent his knee to us to save us. And he lifted his palms to be crucified for us. This being, this majesty that we serve is our only hope and a perfect definition of integrity in covenant. He will do, and He is faithful and just to do what He said He is going to do. And if our theology contradicts anything that was written concerning what He's going to accomplish, if you say, if I'm out of covenant, He's going to have mercy on me anyway, and He said, you will not go into the land, and you will not stay in my house for doing those things, you have been deceived. We are of a high calling that is di different and separates us from the rest of this world. Our accountability is everything to, in His sight. If He got on His knee first and called Abraham out, that he's got on his knee millions and millions and millions of times to draw out our brothers and sisters, as well as us. This puts a whole new twist on that English word. Let's move on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Okay, well, let's go over that. I wanted to uh, look at the uh, definitions right there. I need, a, I need a bigger bench. I need to, need to get all my books out here. Right, we'll have to make one. Um, if you look over there at, at the right of the study sheet, I've got Jeff Bitter's Ancient Hebrew Lexicon of the Bible in that printout below it. For some reason, I won't print the, the pictures in the hieroglyphics, so you can just look at them here. Um, but if you'll notice the definitions, um, it says in 2039 right there in parentheses, see where it says AC? That stands for action root. Now remember, the Hebrew language, it, it shows action. It's always moving. It's alive. Remember, and they tell us this in the Brit Hanashah, that his word is alive. Okay? So it's, this is the action. Action root means to kneel. And concretely, the CO you see there means concrete. It means knee. See the A-B behind the knee? Abstractly, it means to what? Bless. So even bless, Brother Vance, even bless is an abstract definition from these. It's not concrete. We'll notice something here as we go down and study this a little bit further. Um, look at in V, it has a subsection V there. It means to kneel. To bend the knee, to kneel in homage, or to drink water. Remember the woman at the well? Gideon is 300 soldiers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here with yeah. all of these, all of these wow. concepts. Now remember, yeah. that's why Jeff Bitter's de uh, definitions of the concrete. He does away with all the abstract definitions mm -hmm. and puts the concrete definitions in. So, again, many of these things that we have learned, like some, some people teach that praise or halal in Hebrew is almost the same or in comparison to um, baruch. No, it's not. And we'll look at the, the, the rest of the...
concrete definition show us that. Look at uh, NF in the, in the subsection there. It means knee, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Why do they combine the two there, people? We spoke, we spoke about this not long ago. The reason why it says Hebrew and Aramaic is because this is biblical Hebrew. adopted the Aramaic alphabet and replaced these or the middle uh, if you look there you'll see the middle forms of, of the alphabet they were using that in the, in the time before they went into bondage so that is the letters they would have used at the time of Hellenized yeah. when mm -hmm. the Greek conquered. they would have been reading the right and then once the uh, northern ten tribes were completely dispersed, of course they adopted other uh, alphabets. And if you go by that, and those definitions that are produced by that, what happens when you get into the Greek? Everything is abstract. There's a difference between Hebrew thought and Greek thought. So that's why they always put there, make sure that you know it's Aramaic and Hebrew. Because it's the, he it's the Aramaic form of the Hebrew they used the same definitions, but it was from a different alphabet. I'm, I'm going to ask, when we went into Samuel, and it starts out talking about Nahash and the Amorite. Now, I know who the Malachites, refresh me on who the Amorites were, and how, because it's talking about Amorites. Right. Let's do that on a side note, All right. because we still got two other words to do, real fast. All right. <laughs> Let's do that on a side note, or we'll never get to Torah. All right? Because I was going to try to do this in 45 minutes, and we're pushing 30 right now. All right? Um, so look, at, look down at the subsection at the very end. Now, what I want to submit to you is, see where there's more boxes there? There's more boxes as we go down. It's because they were adding more letters. They were taking on, uh, they were adding other other letters, and the family began to grow and take on new meaning. Mm -hmm. That's the whole thing. Remember the seed, right. the noon at the beginning of a prophet? That's what he was producing, was seed. So every time you see prophet or the noon and the two or three letter root of the noon, adding other letters to it, it's showing you the production of seed. By what? The word. As the alphabet as you add more letters to the Hebrew words, it takes on new meaning, just like our family. Mm -hmm. This man added new meaning to our group mm -hmm. today. Yep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we've had a lot of those additions mm -hmm. as of lately. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, down at the bottom where you see N, N M. Mm -hmm. I want to throw this in there because at the bottom right there, they add, we'll see how you guys are, if you remember this. Head of the ox. Mm -hmm. The head of the ox. And anciently, mm -hmm. that would have been used to, to mean the mighty one of Israel, and what was his name? Yeah. Hallelujah. In that last word, the Aleph is added to the family. You can't see it in your handouts because it wouldn't print it. And I also believe that it was the first part of the word. Because the family members can be put in in the middle, at the end, it could be a prefix, a suffix, or they call it an index. When it's not a prefix or a suffix at the beginning or the ending of the word, then it can be put in the middle of the word and it becomes an index. Okay. These letters are getting added from every direction. And that could be added to, say, like a walking staff, for instance. Oh, mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, next set of verses. 
Let's go to Korah, which he is the root of this week's Torah portions. Korah. We're going to go to number 16. And we'll be reading verses 3 through 5. The study of this language and its hieroglyphics is probably one of the most important things that we as a people could have ever... Can you stumble across something? Or that he could have ever... Bend down and lay in our path. It sure brings it into focus. It does. Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, if everybody's there. Mibidmar. Numbers chapter 16 verses 3 through 5. And they assembled against Moshe. Bad decision. Yeah. By the way. Remember, Yahweh had appointed somebody to do a specific work for him here. Not anybody else. Who, who was the only ones that could burn incense? Which, when we get into reading the Torah portions, this becomes a big issue. The man of Yahweh knows how to put people who rise up against and say that they're able to do something and that they are just as set apart as you are. He knows how to put them to the test. Well, if you be that man, or if you be that woman, mm -hmm. grab your incense burner, show up here tomorrow when it's time to burn incense, and we'll see whose incense he accepts. Aaron's sons had already been a very, very crucial sign of what happens to people uh, if that had taken place yet, right. had that taken place yet? When they burned incense? I don't know yet. But anyway, we know the story. Yeah, yeah when, they, when they burned the incense, right. it wasn't accepted. They brought strange fire right. into, and that's, that's the whole thing. That's what he's telling them here. If you guys think that you can just overthrow who Yahweh has appointed to do certain things and do it your own way, and you think that you're still set apart by not going through the process that he said to use? We'll see tomorrow. When the sun comes up, we'll know. Eliyahu. Same, same, same example. Hallelujah. Okay. And they assembled against Moshe and against Aaron and said to them, Enough of you. For all the congregation is set apart, all of them. And Yahweh is, is in their midst. Why then do you lift up yourselves above the assembly of Yahweh? And when Moshe heard it, he fell on his face. Let's, let's go ahead and clarify something. He didn't fall on his face before Korah. No. 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 He, he fell on his face before Yahweh and said, Father, don't strike him dead right now. Right. Give us an opportunity to work with this guy. Don't pass judgment on him just yet. Because he already knew. A man of Yahweh can see and smell the trouble coming a mile away. And so he knew he needed to fall on his face just like he did for Aaron when Aaron built the calf. He was an intercessor. Okay. And he spoke to Korah and all his company saying, Tomorrow morning Yahweh shall make known who is his and who is set apart and bring him near to him, and let him bring near to him the one whom he chooses. This is also showing us that Yahweh has already chose the people that is going to be redeemed, or, excuse me, the world has been redeemed, but he already chose the people in who he would give his Torah, his commands, and, as a matter of fact, he also chose Israel to be the ones that would actually be at, the, at their hands the demise of his son. He chose them for all of that. He said, I'm going to find you. I've got to sanctify you people because I'm going to do a work in you. 
He never sanctified any other group of people. And if we think that we can rise up and come up with our own thoughts, our own ways of doing things, and still go into that inheritance, that's not what we're seeing here. Yeah. Uh, when we go into the reading of the Torah portions, we're going to see that what happened to Korah and all those who followed him. He wasn't ordained. He says, we've been set apart. We don't need you. He's in our midst. So why are you raising yourself? Yahweh rose him up. Yahweh lifted me up. Yahweh has lifted us all up and put us into the position of where we're at. And if somebody comes along and says, I want your position, Yahweh takes a problem. He has a problem with that. As a matter of fact, I don't want my mom's position. She cooks all day Thursday, Friday, trying to get this stuff done. Because I want to. Right. You're doing it for him. But what I'm saying is, I don't, I don't want anybody else's position. I want to be where he put me to be and do what he said for me to do. Right on. That's where my responsibility is going to, I'm going to be accountable for that which he told me to speak. Mm -hmm. If I don't speak it, I'm going to be in just as much trouble as if I spoke it and it was false. So you better speak. <laughs> don't roll the dice. He has put us in these positions. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to study... The name Korah. Okay, and as you can see on your handouts, it's number 7141 in the Hebrew. Okay. Number 71. 7141 in the Hebrew. Is Korah. And it says uh, it comes from 7139, and that's where we get the, the actual definition of Korah's name. It's Korah. And that was also the name of two Edomites. Uh, so in 7139, we see Korah. And this is the primitive root telling us that that's where the name came from. Primary root. And it means to depilate. To what? Depilate. Depilate? I had to look it up too, don't worry. It means to depilate or be depilated means... This is out of the Webster's. Mm -hmm. To remove hair from part of body. Hmm. To shave. <laughs> now, yeah. what was the hair given to men, women, and everybody else for? A covering for the body. That's why Paul says what he says about women's hair. If she's not going to do this and this and this, and it's better for her to just be shaven. Because the hair was given to her for a glory, a steam for the women. A natural covering. Right? But here we see that Korah means to remove covering. Yeah, it's funny. What happened in these scriptures that we just read? Yeah. He rose up against the priesthood, which is the covering of Israel. And he removed him and his followers out from underneath. The covering of Yahweh. Yeah. His name defines who and what he was to become. And I submit to you that, that he, that's also a picture of what Hasatan has done with the third of the angels and most of this world that's going down the toilet. Mm -hmm. He is removing everybody very systematically from out from underneath Yahweh's covering because... The preachers today are not telling you how to do this. How to actually be in covenant with the Father. They are, they are keeping them from even getting underneath the covering. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're blaspheming the covering. They are. Very normal. 
So Korah removed himself and others this day out from underneath the covering. And as we're going to read in our Torah portions, we'll see what happened to those people. Mm -hmm. The earth opened up mm -hmm. and swallowed them. Correct? Yep. Now let me take you forward in time to a day and an age that hasn't happened yet. At the end of the thousand year millennial reign, what's going to happen? There's a lake of fire, a pit, that has already been, it's there. And the uh, beast and the false prophet is already there. And Satan and all of his armies and all of the people that will not submit to this and go into the kingdom and Sukkot with Yahweh's people are going in there. And this is a picture of that. The earth is going to consume them. And sin will be forever, hallelujah, removed from this earth. The smell of burnt hair. <laughs> Absolutely. I love it. Your way of words is... Yeah. Yeah. But that's true. That, that smell is... Oh, yeah. Horrible. Oh, yeah. Now let's take a look at this, uh, this last word that I wanted to study. It's in the book of Luke. We'll be uh, going to chapter 18, verses 40 through 43. person? They're asking him. This is a blind person asking people, what's going on? What, what's all the commotion? Okay, and they explain to him, Yahshua of Nazareth is coming. And he went, oh really? I need to speak of him. But notice it's a blind man here. Mm. Scales are on. Right. <laughs> Verses 40 through 43. And Yahshua stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, What do you wish me to do for you? And he said, Master, to receive my sight. And I submit to you that until Yehuda does this. Yeah. Remember, this is taking place over in the land. Yeah. Until Yehuda says, I need to receive my sight. I'm ready to accept you. Please show me your name. Yeah, who you are. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, uh, what do you wish me to do for you? And he said, Master, to receive my sight. Let me see. And Joshua said to him, receive your sight. Your belief has saved you. Notice that until this man received his sight, he wasn't redeemed. That word there, save, it means redeem. Until people actually see who he is. He just heard and said, you know what? I've heard of all of the healings. I've heard of all of this stuff. And I, I need him. I'm blind. I need to see. I want to live. I need to be redeemed. And he said, you believe it. Let me show you who I am. Just like he did to the, uh, the brothers on the road to Emmaus. He's going to open up the scriptures to them and they're going to see. Hallelujah. Verse 43. Not the next day or two hours later. But immediately he received his sight. And what? Was following him. Praising Elohim. And all the people seeing it gave praise to Elohim. 
This is going to be. This is a picture, I believe, of that day when Yehuda and all of Israel that's sojourning with those people that have not yet received the revelation of just who Yahshua was, that he was truly the Mashiach, that that day, that's a picture of this. It's going to be a day when everybody rejoices and Israel and Yehuda come together as one and everybody is going to sing praises to our Elohim. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Yes. Now what I want to do is, you'll see I've, I've got the word following. There are some versions it's followed. In the Strong's, it's in the Greek section. One ninety. Following or followed. This definition is a real eye opener. first letter in the Greek alphabet. Right? It says, as a particle union, properly a road to be in the same way with to accompany especially as a disciple. You see that? It comes from the first letter. We just went over the bet being the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, or excuse me, the first letter in the first word of the Hebrew scriptures, right? See what this is showing us? It's got the letter the letter that is the first one in their alphabet too. So this points out who we're supposed to be following as well. The one. It says, a road, remember, Yahshua speaks of this road. It's a narrow path, right? And his disciples are to be in the same way. This is when Yahshua was walking the earth and this blind man received his sight and immediately he walked in the same exact way of Yahshua. Yahshua turned in to go to Shabbat. This man was on his heels and at his feet. This man turned in. Yahshua turned in to go to the feast. This man was there and at his feet. And in doing that, he brought praise and blessings to Elohim. What does it truly mean to follow the, the Savior of the world? It means to be on the same road, the same path, and to be in the same way that he walked. So there I submit to you, everybody that's joining in over the internet, the YouTube channel, and Vimeo, and all of you uh, teachers out there, that my critics, how can you even say by looking at the Greek definition that we are not supposed to celebrate Shabbat and follow the commandments if this Greek definition even explains that we are supposed to follow him completely just as Caleb did. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. 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 Even the Greek definitions are telling us exactly what we should be following. Alab, Alpha. Baruch Habab Hashem Yahweh. Blessed is he who come in the name of Yahweh. That's who we are following, the one who Yahweh has blessed. So if we're going to follow him, how can we expect to receive the blessings if we do not do what he did? Are we truly following him? How are we in covenant if we are not? Because he was always in covenant with the Father. He always did the things that pleased him. Hallelujah. <coughs> so these definitions are going to kickstart us into uh, the study of the Torah. Um, 
And I pray that, that everybody has, has got a little bit of uh, understanding under, under their belt that they didn't have when they got here. And uh, also everyone that's, that's going to be uh, seeing this via DVDs or the internet, we just suggest that you take this link and share it with all your friends. Go to the website, and we bless you as well. And uh, that will conclude the word study for today.